I ended up playing just over 30 RPGs in 2023, and while there were some that were a waste of time, there were many that ended up being highlights. Here are the 10 best JRPGs I played in 2023, and at number 10 is the original Blue Reflection. So a quick bit of clarification before we carry on, not every entry on this list is a game that released in 2023. There are some here that are from my never-ending backlog of games. This is how I've done these lists previously, and it's no different this time either. I'll also be keeping this list to one per franchise. As for Blue Reflection, there might be a collective gasp from some corners of the audience, as there's no doubt it has many flaws. I'll admit as much, Blue Reflection is far from perfect, and I will also say that Second Light is the better game in basically every facet. But a game gets into my good books if it fulfills a very simple criteria, that being, is it actually fun to play? And Blue Reflection definitely hits that mark, though not in the traditional sense. It's a classic case of being able to look over its frayed edges to see a flawed work of art. In this title, you join Yuzu, Lime and Hinako as they live out a seemingly normal life as high school students, and it's focused mainly around the aftermath of an injury sustained by Hinako, who earlier on in her life was an internationally recognised dancer. Hinako soon after gains the power of a reflector, and this transformation allows her and the other two to solve the problems of their classmates in their free time. They do this by delving into the other world and cutting the source of their ailments at the root. That cause is mostly out of control emotions, and the trio have to fight against otherworldly beings in order to help those in the real world. Combat is basic, a turn-based system that isn't going to surprise any fan of the genre. In many cases, these fights are over in a flash, but when you get to the impressive boss battles, the whole tone shifts. Though they themselves are still fairly simple overall, you'll often have plenty of opportunity to use all of the tools in your arsenal, which require a decent amount of setup to pull off. These bosses themselves form milestones within the story too, and it's clear the game has an uncomplicated structure. Do quests, roam the school, go on dates, and beat a boss every now and then. The game proceeds in this fairly linear manner, as Hinako not only looks to overcome her own demons, but also reflects on the struggles of others at the same time. Now if the combat section didn't clue you in, then I'll make it clear here. If you're looking for a challenge, then Blue Reflection will not be for you. There is no traditional levelling up in this game, instead, as Hinako, Yuzu and Lime help other students, they are rewarded with fragments which then allow them to allocate points to certain parameters. What this means is that if you're not just steamrolling through the main story, you're often so far ahead of the curve that no enemy you face will even pose a threat. But for me, that works to its benefit, because Blue Reflection was never about the challenge. It certainly has elements to it that are shallow overall and could have used more diversity, but if Blue Reflection excels at anything, then it would be its atmosphere. Instead of going down the traditional fantasy routes of many contemporaries, Blue Reflection instead goes for a more calming feel, not necessarily melancholic or sombre, but slow and serene, as if drifting in a small boat downstream, and only at certain points will it ignite into a frenzy. Most of the time though, you're just walking around the school, talking to other characters and deepening your bonds. It's more about the journey than the end goal here. Props also have to be given to its OST as well, that complements the surroundings positively throughout, and is a definite highlight of the game overall. Blue Reflection embodies a more profound experience below the surface, a serene pool that is actually far deeper than it initially lets on. This is not a fantastical adventure where you brave countless trials in far-off lands, but it never needed to be. And for that reason, Blue Reflection ended up being a memorable experience, one that stood out from the crowd. And that is why it ends up at number 10. At number 9 is Atelier Rise of Free. Now while Rise of Free was a step down in many ways from the second game, which I made very clear in my review, it's still a great game. And I'd say overall, I had more fun with this than I did in Atelier Marie's remake, so it deserves recognition. As a game that closed off the trilogy, Rise of Free was intended as the coming of age adventure. The game that would show the growth of the characters from where they started to where they are now. In many cases, it does succeed there, and I say it has one of the most satisfying endings I've seen in the Atelier series to date. The gameplay elements themselves, though, were more polarising. Rise of Free expanded the map massively into this semi-open world format where the zones themselves have doubled or tripled in size. It felt comparable to the maps from Atelier Theorists in some ways, and as a result, there's plenty to find too. 
Combat takes on the archetype seen in Atelier Riser 2 with the ATB approach where you can freely switch between members and also have a couple of support members to exchange with to extend combos further. Keys are the new element brought in the freshen it up, but they can also be used for exploration and alchemy as well. Alchemy is also still enjoyable, utilising the node-based system that the Riser games are known for. That being said, it is a very easy system to break as well due to the nature of how the zones are laid out. If you get to the deep parts of the maps, you find high quality ingredients with even better traits. This meant by the 10 hour mark, I had everything I needed to finish the game, which is fine by me. I've never had an issue with the game being easy because of player input and understanding mechanics. That's just rewarding the effort. The only thing I wasn't completely on board with was the story, which, while decent and ended well, took a bit longer than I think it should have done. I couldn't help but feel that Gust were a little fatigued during this game in that they were struggling to come up with ways to end all these character arcs in a satisfying way, and the later parts of the game show that. Combine that with the stilted translation and technical issues upon launch, and Rise of Free did lose a few credits come the end. That being said, even when Gust aren't at their best, they can still create a fulfilling experience, as was the case in this final game for the trilogy. At number 8 is Xenosaga Episode 3. With Episode 1 voted for by my patrons this year, I took the executive decision to play through the whole trilogy after finishing that game, and I'm glad I did. There was no way I was going to drop the series after the events in the first game. And while I wouldn't call the Xenosaga series a masterpiece due to its fluctuations in quality, especially in Episode 2, it certainly ended on a high note come the final game. Episode 3 was where everything came together for Monolith Soft. All of the issues in the first two games were rectified here. Episode 3 as a result had the best combat, the best cinematics, the best art style, the best music, and it ended in a surprisingly fulfilling way despite the amount of content that was cut from the original plan. While there were some elements that I wish were expanded on more and I couldn't help but feel let down with what Xenosaga could have been if its original form saw the light, Episode 3 was a fair compromise. Following a year after the events of Episode 2, the game rejoins Shion, Cosmos, Junior, and the crew as they seek to discover the truth behind recent events, and eventually stop them. As a conclusion to these events, the stakes are high from the beginning, and Episode 3 dives into many of the mysteries from the prior games, and indeed side games too, in order to round out the experience. Some fall a bit flat, but many are done well. It helps as well that the music is on point, with Yuki Kajiura taking the reins for the entire OST this time around. She did an excellent job with the cutscenes in Episode 2, and did just as good a job on the compositions in Episode 3, bringing many of the more impactful moments to life. As for combat, it not only took on the most simple archetype of the three games, but it also became the best for that same reason. Episode 3 used a standard turn-based formula, no stocks, no zones, just a basic outline of attacks and skills that effortlessly became the best the series had to offer. I can't emphasise enough how relieved I was when I first started playing the game. While I can't fault the ambition of Xenosaga in trying something different, there are times when simple is best. And that pretty much becomes the closing statement as to what Xenosaga is. It's a series that cannot be faulted in terms of its ambition and where it's intended to be. But as was the case so often in the early stages of Takahashi's career, the goal was simply too difficult to obtain for where the studio was at that time. I honestly think that if Xenosaga were to be revisited from the beginning in the present day, we might actually get to see what the studio envisioned all those years ago. And who knows, after the events of Future Redeemed, there might be a slight chance that something is already in the pipeline for that. Number 7 will be taken by studio-sized debut title, In Eternite. An anti-aging drug, a zombie apocalypse, the end of the world, screw all that noise, we're here to reproduce. Eternites was great, a dating sim action RPG hybrid that I knew was going to be a hit as soon as I played the demo. The core of the gameplay is split. Most of the time you'll be spending it on a train in between main story missions where you partake in the social sim aspect to raise your abilities for the coming fights. And you'll have a set number of days to do so before you have to progress the story. These events will grant essences that can be used to not only improve your own skills, but also grant abilities to your partners like buffs, spells and healing abilities, not to mention also yielding straight up stat increases. 
The actual character events themselves, though, are a highlight too. All of the love interests are well written, and they're all distinct from one another too. Eventually, though, you will need to leave the train and progress the story, meaning you get involved in the game's combat. It's visceral, fast, and the controls feel tight. There's plenty of abilities to use, and due to the social sim aspect, the combat is gradually enriching over time with further skills and supporting abilities. The dungeons are pretty good too, there's certainly a good diversity of scale in there from research institutes to labyrinthian structures, and they've got a strong variety of puzzles too, I was fairly impressed with the creativity on display for these brain teasers. I was pleasantly surprised with Eternites when all was said and done. For an indie project that promised a lot, I think it delivered, and in some cases exceeded my expectation. There are several cases where the game appears to go above and beyond despite having a clear budget, like multiple language support for voiceovers and actual animated cutscenes outsourced to a studio. It does have drawbacks for sure, as many of these games do. I think the OST is weak and the scavenging missions are tacked on, but the majority of it is at least solid. What really surprised me with Eternites though is that it was great nearly all the way through, capped off with an inspired ending. This is how you end a game correctly, you take the most important aspect of your journey, match the tone of the message you're attempting to convey, and just go for it. I was very happy with my experience by the end, as was I happy to hear that Studio Psy recently received $7 million in funding for their next project, and it's very well deserved. After this game, I am very much looking forward to what they come up with next. At number 6 is an oldie, but a goodie, and Gust's oft-forgotten gem, Art and Elico Melody of Alemia. It's a collaborative work between Ban Presto as publisher and Gust as developer from 2006, and it's a shame that it's often overshadowed in Gust's portfolio considering the recent success of Atelier. As the first game in my retro series, I was very satisfied when all was said and done. The game takes place in the land of Soul Seal, a continent with two notable structures, those being the Tower of Artanelico and the landmass of the Wings of Horus, which also acts as a separator between the civilizations. The lower world is generally considered less technically literate but thirsting for knowledge, while the higher world is defined more by its technology and serving a predetermined purpose. In this universe, music plays a core motif, and the so-called Raver Tales bend the power of songs to their will. Melody of Alemia uses a turn-based battle system similar to Atelier Iris. Turn order is displayed on an above timeline, and characters have a choice of skills, attacks, items, or most notably, the ability to guard the Raver Tail who operates on the backline. The use of the Raver Tail is the defining feature of this combat. While the active members on the front line are limited by turn order, the Raver Tail has no such restraints and can act whenever the player wishes with either attack or support abilities. It's still got the draw of a turn based system, but the Raver Tail ensures that there are lots of options and player input required throughout rather than simply waiting for a turn to occur. These battles also make you aware of something else that the game excels at. The OST is godlike. Now in typical Gust fashion, it's more about the journey than the end goal itself. While there is a decent story and melody of Alemia, the highlight is most certainly the Raver Tales themselves, who are basically the love interests. This game doubles as a dating sim with plenty of innuendo to boot. Even with that though, there's a good level of depth to each of them. Everyone has their own story to tell, their own goals, and it's fulfilling to see them play out. Once you build your trust enough, you can also dive into ever-deepening levels of the Cosmosphere, which are basically the subconscious domain of the Raver Tale. In this instance, the game becomes more akin to a visual novel, with greater importance placed on the dialogue and character development. And this is where most of the Raver Tale's backstories are made clear to us, along with granting new abilities for them to use at certain points. It's the window to their motivations and anxiety, and it only gets more intense the further you go down. It's an inspired way to address character development without disrupting the flow of the main story by diverting the cast for some arbitrary reason, and they quickly became my favourite part of the game. I wouldn't call Melody of Alemia infallible, but it has soul and a clear direction and tone from the get-go. Whether it be through its combat, its music, its world, or the characters themselves, Melody of Alemia harmonises in all the areas that Gust are so adept at. Breaking into the top 5 is Star Ocean's Second Story R, a classic case for me of a game being hampered by its narrative. If it could execute that aspect, it would most likely be at the top of this list, but I couldn't give it more than an 8 out of 10 because it struggled in the area I put the most importance on. But the fact it's still in the top 5 despite that issue is a testament to how good the rest of it is. 
Just on the surface, it looks amazing. In fact, the remake as a package is just very well done, bringing a classic up to modern standards while still maintaining the aspects that made the original great. The combat is good, maybe a little outdated, but a decent take on an action-centric system. But really, the combat is merely a visualization of the actual highlights of the game. Second Story R has so many options tied to it that it becomes very easy to break. Every character has a host of specialties tied to them and they all have a specific use. These give not only certain abilities but also flat stat increases, but if you combine them together in the right way you can make, say, game-breaking equipment within the first couple of hours. There's a staggering amount of customization available to the player, and they all enrich the gameplay in a multitude of ways, either through combat, equipment management, or traversing the world itself. And I think that Star Ocean 2's greatest strength for that reason isn't the combat itself, but the tools given to you to interact with the combat and world as a whole. If you comprehend them and use them right, the later story events become a joke, and makes multiple playthroughs worthwhile if you simply want to find more ways to break the game. At the very least though, you'd want to play through the game twice as a minimum due to the dual protagonist feature, with Claude and Rayner having their own unique moments in the narrative despite having plenty of overlap. In addition, there are a massive amount of recruitable characters during the journey too, but not all of them can be taken on a single journey, ensuring that the second playthrough is once again worthwhile. Now while I think the side characters themselves are a bit shallow after they join the party, they all play in unique ways, so at least there's a fresh aspect given on the gameplay side of the spectrum. But if you're purely here for deep characters and story, then SO2R will come up short. Star Ocean 2 has a better story than it has writing. That is the quote I coined from someone else in regards to the game and its narrative. A journey that has many great moments within it, but doesn't deliver them well enough to be memorable. That grievance is most notable in the antagonists, who are the weakest part of the game for me. The issue is that Star Ocean 2 employs the Souls-like style of storytelling for many of their backstories, which can work, I am a fan of that type of storytelling, but the key difference is in the makeup of the games. Despite the amount of lore inherent in the worlds, story is never the focus of a Souls game. Someone can easily play through one of FromSoft's titles blinds and not comprehend the story at all. The same is not true of a traditional JRPG, which has story as a focus with linear events leading to its eventual conclusion. In short, all key elements in the story must be given to the player so they can relate to what is happening on screen, but that does not happen. To say that this method doesn't work, though, would be incorrect. There will be a game later on this list that uses the same style of storytelling, but in my opinion, does it far better. All in all, though, Star Ocean Second Story R was a great game. A well-done remake of a classic that delivered in many aspects, and it easily earns its position on this list. Just falling outside the top three at number four is Kuro no Kiseki 2 Crimson Sin, the sequel to the upcoming Western release of Trails Through Daybreak. Now I made clear last week that I think Crimson Sin will divide opinion, even more so than games like Cold Steel 4, because it goes against the traditional formula of the series as a whole. The second game in the arc is generally where large strides are made in the overall narrative, but that just doesn't happen in Crimson Sin, not in my opinion at least. Even so, it's still a great game, hence why it's on this list. Sure, I played Reverie 2 this year, but I already did that three years ago. Crimson Sin was a completely fresh experience, so naturally it was going to win out if I was going for one per franchise. It plays very similarly to the first game, as you would expect, but there are some notable positives like its improvements in the OST, the greater character focus overall, and its souped-up combat. The combat in particular is just a refreshed version of the original, an action-based overworld mode as you explore, followed by the turn-based command mode at the push of a button. Crimson Sin's additions came in both modes. The action-based mode has chain-link maneuvers and quick arts, while command mode brought fan favourites like S-Craft cut-ins back and added the EX Chain 2, which functions as a combination craft. The combat is still as enjoyable as it was the first time around, and that isn't the only thing that Crimson Sin does well. The cutscenes have also benefited in this sequel. Kuro no Kiseki was the first game that utilised Falcom's new engine for a complete experience, which was already a notable step up in presentation. Crimson Sin just worked on that aspect more, and the results are pleasing. 
The engine is in full swing here in regards to cutscenes in that they happen more frequently and they feel more impactful than the original game. They just seem increasingly smooth and I'm a big fan of how they will often transition from a standard text-based presentation to these more impressive looking cutscenes without warning. It really does bring the scene to life and I was very much on board with how the characters were presented in the cutscenes. All in all, Crimson Sin is a game I enjoyed for a different reason to others. It felt like more of a character-focused journey overall, a game that goes against expectation. Once again, I've no doubt that Crimson Sin will be divisive when it eventually gets its Western release, but in the same breath, it does have clear redeeming quality despite ending up lower on my own personal list of Trails games. We're into the final stretch now, so the cream of the crop in 2023 from my experiences, and we're starting with Barton Kytos Eternal Wings and the Lost Ocean at number 3, or simply the remaster of the first game. Barton Kytos was one of the biggest surprises of the year for me, in a good way. I immediately latched onto its unique narrative approach, where you're working in partnership with the protagonist Callus rather than taking control of him. I loved the pre-rendered backgrounds and the art style for the sprites too, it stood out in all the right areas. And despite the rigidity in the layout of the world, there was plenty to find within it for both side quests and character progression. It was amazing to see all these different ideas come together as well as they did. I noticed very quickly that Barton Kytos is not like many other RPGs. It throws many of the staples out the window and forced me to play by its rules. Tutorials, for example, are in the game, but only if you talk to the NPCs. It's a novel way of doing things in that it's not a traditional way of going about it, but it keeps the immersion of the game. You're not being taken out of the experience to do so. Leveling is done through the accumulation of experience points, which you then need to turn in rather than simply having them granted to you at the end of battle. It also pays to level up as infrequently as possible so that you can get the stacking bonuses that come from leveling up several times at once. But the biggest draw of Barton and Kytos are the Magnus, or in layman's terms, the cards. While they're used in virtually every aspect of this universe, they're mostly going to be seen in combat. Every character has a deck of cards that you can freely customise in the way you want, and they're used to battle. And as many trading card games require, you need a good balance to circumvent the dangers in this world. There are elements to contend with, numbers that function as the way to increase damage, and you noticeably feel the increase in power of your decks as you make your way through the game. That sense of becoming more powerful is always there. But the greatest strength of the card-based system is that it feels fair. The game is difficult, no doubt about that, but any sort of difficulty spike can be circumvented, mostly through the composition of your deck, in addition to leveling up of course. It's mechanics like this that ensure that every fight in Barton Kytos is unique and challenging, but never cheap. Anytime I lost a fight, the first thing I would look to would be the composition of my deck. I never felt frustrated with losing in Barton Kytos, and that's the thing that stands out to me the most. Of course, I can't praise Barton Kytos as well without mentioning its OST, which is just some of Matoi Sakuraba's greatest work in my opinion. The negatives, well, they are there, but they're also so minor compared to the overall package here that I pretty much forgot they even existed. Frustrating in parts, sure, but never overbearing. Barton Kytos is brilliant. One of the best RPGs I played this year, and I recommend it to any fan of the genre. Number two is for one of the most charming games I will likely ever play in the Super Mario RPG remake. What can I say about this game that hasn't already been said before? It was everything I wanted. As a person who never got to finish the original when I was much younger, this was equal parts nostalgia as it was settling an old regret. What was great about Super Mario RPG is that it was exactly what I expected it to be. Every Mario game I play, whether it be a traditional platformer, golf, Mario Party or Mario Kart, I go into those games with a clear idea of what I'm going to be getting in mind. I expect light-hearted humour, excellent sound design and colourful visuals. Super Mario RPG hits every single facet and excels in each one. It combines the RPG and platforming genres beautifully. It's seamless, both on the overworld and the combat itself. 
It was one of the most memorable experiences I had this year for all the right reasons. I was smiling and laughing at nearly everything happening. It was absurd, it was manic, but it's Mario. I expect this to happen. Mini games will pop up frequently, but they're never forced or contrived. They always flow directly into the makeup of the journey itself, and some cutscenes will play on the excellent sound design to create a sort of interactive moment in the story that just oozes charm. The characters are brilliant, familiar yet wonderful designs for the returning cast, charming appearances for the new entries, and dialogue that is so simple but so impactful at the same time. Super Mario RPG had a tone in mind when these characters were written, and everything you see on screen is tailored to fit that atmosphere. I adore this game, I recommend it to anyone who has a Switch, and I'd also happily recommend it to people who aren't fans of the genre. This one here is a great game to get people introduced to the world of JRPGs for the first time. It's charming, it's goofy, it's got a familiar premise, and a host of lovable characters, a must buy for any fan of the franchise. Right, now before we move to number one, I do want to give a brief honourable mention to one game that I feel deserves it. It would have easily made this list, if not for the fact it's more a mystery adventure title than a JRPG, but I wanted to at least give it a highlight because it left such an impression on me, and I'm confident many other fans of the genre can enjoy it too. I'm talking about Master Detective Archives Rain Code, one of the best stories I've played through in recent memory. It's a game that nails its atmosphere, its characters, and its overall premise. I went into this game with apprehension, but come the end of it, I would recommend it to anyone who loves a great story. What a game it was. And at number one, well, it was never in doubt for me despite how early in the year it released. No matter how many JRPGs I played in 2023, nothing could surpass the brilliance of Octopath Traveler 2, which in my eyes is the gold standard for JRPGs. And yes, it would have gone on my 10 out of 10 list from earlier in the year, but I didn't want to ruin what my favourite game of 2023 was going to be. I remember playing that 3 hour demo, and it took about a third of that time to realise that this sequel would be right up my alley. I adored it from start to finish, from the characters, to the stories, the music, the art style, everything was near on perfect. I could not put this game down from the moment I picked it up all the way to the end, and I'm certain one reason for that is how different it feels from the traditional approach to the genre. Octopath Traveler 2 just releases you into the wild to make your own story. This here is a game that encapsulates the feeling of adventure, the thrill of the unknown. Not since East 8 have I experienced something like this. It gives you so much freedom in a genre that doesn't really champion that aspect. And what a great decision that was to give you the opportunity to get lost in this universe. I was so enamoured with the world and the multitude of ways I could interact with it that it worked to my detriment in that I quickly overleveled myself. By the time I got to the second chapter of the individual stories, many of my team were well into the 50s, which made story progression a joke. But that was my choice, and that's never a bad thing. It's a sign of a great game when it's happy to give more control to the player to progress in the way they want. And like I say, this world was so rich and full of secrets that I couldn't help myself. I had to explore everything. Adding on to its exploration was its fantastic combat, fast, visceral, oozing in customization, and even though one of the only drawbacks of the game involved revisiting inns to reshuffle the party at points, it wasn't a problem for me as I was just so hooked on the combat. Not to mention, each character felt wholly unique in what they brought to the table, and the reason they felt so unique was because of their distinct and engaging backgrounds told through the individual stories. The story, or stories, was the element that many players felt was a weakness of the first game, and I confess the part I was worried about. How could they take eight stories and combine them? How could they make this world weave around eight different narratives? Well, they managed to do it. I don't know how, but they did an amazing job here. Octopath Traveler 2 has wondrous storytelling, if you pay attention to it. Should you take the time to really dig beneath the lore and connect the dots, you'll start to find even more nuggets of information that brings this world to life even more than it initially shows. In other words, it's got that Souls-like storytelling. And this is the thing. Back with Star Ocean Second Story R, I mentioned there was one more game on this list that utilised the same method of storytelling, but does it much better. Octopath Traveler 2 is that game. 
Because even though there are plenty of hidden secrets in the world, the actual surface level information, which in this case are the stories specific to each character, are satisfying. They're good. They have a clear beginning that forms the motivation for the character, followed by the journey and the final conclusion. While they vary in quality, all of them were enjoyable. In other words, no character was left behind in this game. They all had moments to shine, and anything else that was found in the world just added more to those stories. The stuff that was left out did not take away from the overall delivery. They were perfectly sufficient without them. But if you did put in that extra effort, you were rewarded with just a little bit more. And that's why I think Octopath Traveler 2 is not only masterful in gameplay, it is masterful in its narrative too. It's well deserving of being at the top of this list, the best RPG I played in 2023, and a bar that I will measure many others against in the future. Thank you for watching this video. If you liked it, please like and subscribe for more JRPG content, and consider joining my Patreon if you're interested. Peace.